you very much, Professor Poruchin. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Stephanie and Marwa that made this event possible. Um, I'm also really uh, happy to be able to present the work that I did in these two years of my PhD. And as Francesco said, um, mainly relate to the healthcare system policy responses, and actually now also uh, on the vaccine rollout strategies that have been implemented since uh, the beginning of 2021, when vaccines have been authorized. So uh, I would like to give you a brief presentation about uh, myself. Uh, I am in uh, my third year of PhD. I just started this year. And I got my uh, master's degree in health economics and finance from the University of Bologna in Italy. And previously, I got my bachelor in economics uh, from the University of Rome, Sapienza. Clearly, my area of interest uh, are health economics and health financing. And I'm also very interested in the cost sharing design uh, arrangements implemented in health insurance markets. And now I'm also exploring a new area of interest that is related to health behaviors and preferences that I will show at the end of the presentation just a bit of what I'm doing uh, now in my new project for the thesis. So the agenda for today um, is, uh, as Francesco said, a description of the work that I conducted with some of uh, our colleagues. I will briefly uh, introduce the uh, research that I'm conducting, and then I will go through the uh, papers that have been uh, developed. You will see uh, that there is a watershed in the uh, narrative of my uh, research, that is uh, the vaccine salurization. Uh, so the first part of the presentation will relate to what happened before vaccines were authorized, and the second one will instead uh, focus on what happened after vaccines have been authorized. And if I have time, I will also present uh, the current project, uh, but let's see later. So the research overview. Uh, this is a slide just to present uh, why I was really interested to uh, investigate uh, infectious disease and particularly the COVID-19 pandemic. There are three main dimensions that are quite interesting from an health economic perspective. The first uh, is, uh, from an health policy perspective, the evidence that uh, infectious disease and pandemics are a considerable threat for the society. And uh, literature and research suggests that they will intensify in the future. So it's very important to set best practices and policy ratings for future waves of COVID, but also for future public health crises. From a pure economic perspective, um, it's very interesting to study infectious disease because they are considered as an externality. And for the, uh, according to the uh, welfare um, theorem, um, they are a common market failure. When we talk about infectious disease, we really uh, use the term infectious externalities. Uh, that basically uh, means that someone risky behavior affects the risk of others contracting the virus, regardless of their own behavior. So there is this missing transaction costs between these individuals. And also, uh, looking at the vaccines, um, there is a contrary externalities. Uh, in this case, is a positive one, because the consumption of vaccines clearly produces not only a protection for the individual that actually consume the vaccine, but also for the others, so for the old society. So it's quite interesting to look at this aspect as well. And finally, uh, the third dimension that is quite interesting is a regulatory one, because the economic theory uh, suggests that to fix externalities, so market failure, there is the need to um, have a third party that is typically um, um, the government or the state to fix such market uh, failure, to make the market outcomes more efficient, but also more equitable. So given this background, uh, my research really tried to assess the health economic impact of the policies implemented to face COVID-19, try also to produce best practices and important policy indication for planning the response and the cost of future waves of COVID and future pandemics. Um, I would like to do this by uh, four main uh, aims. The first one is developing a conceptual framework that provides a qualitative taxonomy of government policy directives and their intensity. 
Second one is really try to predict and evaluate the determinants that affect the intensity of the policy making response. Third one is to uh, develop and utilize methodology as for the purpose of eliciting vaccine preferences uh, at individual level and also in an international comparison fashion. So really try to understand the different preferences at country level. And finally, also try to look at what has been the impact of um, COVID-19 policy responses on a micro level that is really related to the hospital system, particularly to for those units that have competing resources uh, uh, relatively to uh, the COVID-19 treatments. Uh, one of these examples could be, for example, trauma unit. Okay, so I will now start uh, with the first of this aim. And uh, so we develop a conceptual framework uh, with my colleagues that are reported here, Naomi Moy, Mattia Kilstedt, Professor Fiorentini, and Professor Forucci. Uh, and, it's, and in the title of this work is Standardizing Policy and Technology Responses in the Immediate Aftermath of a Pandemic. So the background for this uh, research and this study was that the classification of the virus, the COVID-19 from a, a notifiable disease to a pandemic, clearly uh, pushed governments to step away from the status quo and implement unusual policies. This clearly uh, produced a large amount of variation in the number of policy and type of policy initiated by, by governments in response to the virus. Uh, and this clearly before the authorization of vaccines, because clearly when vaccines are uh, available for policymakers, these become uh, the most effective tool that they can use to fight the pandemic and to minimize the spread of the disease and the consequent uh, epidemiological and economic outcomes. So the problem of this large variation uh, in the policy responses is that for policymakers and decision makers is clearly very difficult to understand the impact of government policy and technology intervention on epidemiological and economic outcomes when this uh, policy response is, uh, is uh, uh, live, I would say, so is in the making. Um, and an additional problem is that all these policies have been implemented simultaneously inside each country. And we know that uh, the policy response has huge externalities also for other countries. Uh, another aspect that is interesting also to investigate, to, to take in mind when we uh, analyze this uh, aspect, is the possible probability that vaccines may be developed in a relatively short time, as was the case, for example, for the COVID 19 experience. So, some policies that were uh, or seems to be effective in the short run might not be as effective in the long run to target, for example, low level of cases. And this we have seen. Uh, for example, for the Australian experience, where we have a really aggressive uh, uh, strategies, but then with the availability of vaccines, we were not so able to uh, minimize the spread. So to try to solve this problem, we developed the categorizing policy and technology intervention to a viral outbreak framework, the CPTI, that provides a conceptual and comparative structure that indeed facilitates the investigation of policies which are implemented before uh, vaccines availability and after the pandemic declaration. The objective is clearly to systematically compare the effect of such policies within specific categories of such intervention across different countries. And this also set the stage to investigate the rationality and proportionality of the intervention compared to the policy objectives. So I talked about categories. So uh, clearly uh, we have seen, and as I said before, uh, have been implemented uh, a quite large number of policy interventions that reflect different nature. And so uh, to classify such interventions, we develop four uh, categories that you can see here, the first three. The first one is the policy intervention to contain the spread of the virus. And all these interventions relate, for example, to the containment and mitigation measures implemented. The second category relates to the intervention for prevention and care that look really at the uh, resourcing ability of each country to, to treat active cases uh, throughout the uh, pandemic. 
The third one is, um, is related to the policy interventions to reduce the economic impact of containment measures. And then we have also identified a four categories that was quite important in the response strategies uh, for COVID-19. That is a category that reflect the health technology interventions. And these uh, categorize all those innov innovative technological responses that have been applied in testing, tracing, and treating in the individuals with the virus, but also to trace clearly the uh, spread of the virus uh, uh, within the community. So what is the novelty of this framework compared to, for example, the policy triggers that have been developed or, or also the stringency index that have been developed? So we want to add to these uh, tools and we would like to add uh, the categorization system that I just uh, exposed. Uh, and, but also we add uh, an underlying gradient uh, within each of these categories that is able to take care or measure, let's say, the significance and the invasiveness of an intervention within the four categories. So uh, this gradient focuses on the dominant COVID-19 intervention for the, for the four categories, rather than just applied uh, a combination uh, of all the main policy interventions implemented. And this clearly also allows us to identify more clearly the moment in which government escalate or de-escalate the intervention for a specific group of policies and objectives. So I talk about the dominance criterion, uh, but what is in practice? Um, all the categories uh, and the gradient are classified by this uh, dominance criterion that starts from the situation in which there is no intervention, that is the status quo, that can be assimilated to the situation before the start of the pandemic, and then all the other levels of the gradient are established by identifying a dominant intervention that work as a domineer for less significant or invasive ones in the same categories. So we develop this uh, gradient based on five main levels, starting from known that takes value of zero to very significant level that takes value of four. For the containment measure, you can think um, uh, in terms of, um, for example, the lockdown measures implemented where all the individuals are uh, obliged to stay at home and referring to all social activities as the significant level. While the very significant, so the dominant intervention to this is when the government apply a lockdown plus the um, suspension of all non-economic all non-economic uh, essential activities. That basically means not only people have to stay home, but also people cannot go to work to an earn income or uh, yeah, um, earn income for their families or uh, do their typical um, activities uh, during, their, uh, during their days or during their uh, life. So to give you a more uh, practical example of this dominance criterion, I reported here what we looked at. So for the policy interventions to contain the spread of the virus, we looked at the level of limitations to individual freedoms that I just uh, discussed. For the uh, policy intervention for prevention and care, we looked at the level of healthcare capacity dedicated to fight the pandemic. For the economic intervention, we looked at the level of government financial and regulatory intervention. And finally, for the health technology intervention, we looked at the continuum of technology advancement. So here I reported the um, like graphical summary of this uh, framework. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a bit small, but I hope you can see. Anyway, you can see on the left, uh, the four categories developed. Uh, we have also defined the escalating and the de-escalating intervention. And then here on the right, you can see for each of the um, levels uh, identified some examples that have been used. Just want to signal for the health technology intervention and the subcategories, the feeding one uh, that has very significant intervention as the food treatment, that is clearly the vaccination. So this framework is not just a, category, uh, a tool to categorize the intervention, but can be also applied to show the dynamic impact of policy intervention on specific outcomes. And to show uh, its application, we looked at uh, 
uh, different countries that are Italy, New Zealand, United Kingdom, and United States. Again, here I report uh, an example of our study. Um, I'm sorry, it's a bit small, but I like uh, to show you what we did. And you can see that for each uh, country, we looked at the four categories uh, here in red with the gradient over time. And we look also at specific epidemiological and economic outcomes. So for example, for the containment measure gradient, uh, we looked, um, for example, at the confirmation rate, that is the number of positive people on the number of total tests um, administered in each county. And you can clearly see that with this gradient and this graphical representation, we can identify the different response strategies applied in these countries. And if we look, for example, at Italy, which is also the country that I will show you uh, later, uh, we can see that the government implemented a quite uh, strict uh, policy uh, strategies in a gradual uh, fashion. Um, and especially the uh, most significant intervention. So the lockdown plus the suspension of all, ne all economic uh, um, activities um, where uh, Italy reached the peak of the confirmation rate. So the number, um, the maximum number of positive cases on the total tests. And you can also see that as soon as this intervention was implemented, the uh, trend of this outcome started to decrease significantly. Um, if you look, for example, at the New Zealand example, you can see that also New Zealand applied a very stringent um, uh, measure as soon as this outcome uh, reached its peak. However, if you see the um, uh, confirmation rate, the value of this, you can see that it's quite smaller compared to Italy. And so this clearly also shows us how the stringency uh, or the strategies was quite different for New Zealand that, uh, that implemented a very aggressive strategies, uh, hoping to eradicate the virus and minimize um, uh, the infection rate uh, within its community. So just to conclude on this, um, the framework uh, that we develop allows for a visualization of the frequency and comparison of dominant policies across countries and gives us also an overview of how dominant intervention affect different set of health and non-health related outcomes during the response strategies. We think that this tool is relevant uh, because uh, the convergence to an optimal set of policy intervention would indeed involve mitigating preventive technological and economic interventions that are connected to the policy objectives. And such a convergence could also provide a useful tool to assist governments in overcoming the instability in the policy process before immunization is implemented. Okay, so if there are no questions... Sorry, Marcello, maybe yes. we, we take a, a little bit, we, we like to take a little bit of a, of a breath uh, yes. and uh, go to the floor. Actually, I see uh, a very uh, enthusiastic is here, very well attended seminar today. So thanks again for coming. Uh, some people that, that I go through uh, that I know and haven't seen because of the pandemic for a very long time, like Daiga, Katie, of course. Uh, yeah, you know, Femke, I mean, I'm just very excited to have you all there. I uh, didn't mean to, to uh, you know, uh, call you out to ask any questions by no means. Uh, uh, but uh, to all the uh, people in the, in the, uh, in the, in the audience, uh, again, if you want to comment, ask questions, uh, please write. Uh, if you have anything urgent, uh, put your hand up or, uh, and Zephany will try to capture you. I don't know how to really do it with, with uh, so many participants, but uh, please write. Probably that's the best way and we'll try to answer now. So any questions now? There, there is one, um, Marcello and Francesco, and that is um, somebody's requesting to see the conceptual model again, perhaps at the end or perhaps now, whatever's most convenient. Okay, probably now is not a bad time. And then I ask Nishir and Suboit to write, uh, so Das and Roy to write their questions while Mar Marcello shows the framework again. Yeah, so I imagine this is the slide that was requested, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so is there a specific question or uh, 
maybe you can just go through it uh, uh, once more. Yes, for sure. So uh, this is just a graphical representation. So the full table then is developed uh, um, deeper in the, in the article that we are uh, finalizing at the moment. Um, so we uh, identified four main categories that are reported here, containment intervention, economic intervention, prevention and care, and health technology. And for the first three, we identified the escalating and the escalating uh, uh, policy responses. Uh, uh, this clearly to uh, track the intensity and the stringency of the intervention over time, because we have seen that uh, with COVID-19 there are waves, and clearly governments try to uh, balance the stringency over time when there, there are um, many cases and many hospitalizations in particular, uh, we have seen a higher stringency, while as soon these uh, measures or let's say outcomes start to decrease, then the implementation of policies started to be, um, let's say, uh, the, the government uh, lifts such restrictions. So in this way, with escalating and escalating, we can really track over time uh, this intervention. And uh, yeah, here there are some examples that we use. Uh, I'm not sure if... Um, I think this is good. Um, okay. I don't see any more uh, comments in the chat, maybe now. Uh, Hi, right, Elijah. Hi, Elijah. Uh, does your model show the most effective policy intervention on case numbers or outside lockdowns and vaccines? Well, this is a good point. Uh, um, it doesn't show the most effective intervention, first of all, because this is very country specific and depends on several factors. Uh, for example, the level of spread of COVID-19. Uh, um, for example, the Italian case is quite interesting and I will show you later. Uh, because Italy was completely unprepared to face the pandemic. So the strategy was quite reactive rather than proactive, as was, for example, the New Zealand strategy, as I, as I discussed before. Uh, however, with this tool, you can really see the moment in which um, the implementation of a, a specific policy in each of these categories really had an effect that is not a casual effect, of course, because this is not a an econometric model, just a descriptive model, uh, but can be clearly further expanded on. Uh, but you can really see graphically and clearly when then the intervention applied and the level of the stringency of this intervention started to have an impact on uh, specific outcomes that you want to consider. Very good. Thank you, Marcello. Please uh, go on. Uh, indeed, it's a nice bridge to the, the Italian case that you studied. Thank you, Elijah and uh, others. Yeah. So um, moving on, um, uh, I want now to present the uh, case studies that we run during the first year of the pandemic into the, in 2020. And uh, we focus on the Italian case. Uh, and this was part of the special issue that the Value in Health Economics and Policy Group developed in collaboration with the LCD journal Health Policy and Technology. Uh, and we look with my colleagues report here at the, uh, the effect of the policy and technology impact uh, um, implemented by the government on health and non-health outcomes. Um, for reasons of this presentation and for time um, uh, reasons, I will not go through all the article, but you can uh, easily find these in uh, health policy and technology, and, or you can just write me an email and I can share with you the, the text and the article. So why is it important uh, or relevant to study the Italian experience within the first uh, year of the pandemic? First of all, Italy was the first Western country to experience a major outbreak of coronavirus, coronavirus sorry, and uh, was also the first country to overtake China uh, in, the ranking, in the ranking of a uh, number of cases and also number of fatalities. We have also observed an unprecedented increase in public health expenditure, uh, and this is quite in contrast with the recent policies adopted by the Italian government that were more directed toward a cut in the financing uh, for the healthcare uh, systems. And this increase was mainly related to the reorganization of the hospital system and in the hiring of uh, healthcare professionals to treat the higher demand related to the COVID-19. Another interest aspect is that during the first year, the virus really affected the northern regions compared to the center and southern regions. And this might be 
uh, and I will show you later, uh, the case because the government at the beginning implemented a national strategy um, and so was able to uh, stop the spread of the virus in the areas where it was already um, uh, very uh, spread around the communities. So to understand the Italian experience, it's very important also to uh, mention the design of the healthcare system in Italy, uh, which is a, a decentralized national healthcare system. And the decentralization is reflected in the financing, the provision and the governance of the 20 regional health systems. Uh, this decentralization also lead to a quite heterogeneous uh, range of healthcare system model. Uh, that indeed ranged from a quasi, uh, from a mixed quasi integrated model, such as the one in Emilia Romagna or in Veneto, to a quasi market model, such as the one that is um, present in Lombard. Lombard was also the region that had the most um, uh, severe uh, impact of the pandemic on its healthcare system. So it's quite interesting to look also at these uh, differences. So here I reported um, the uh, trend uh, of the COVID-19 uh, during the first year of the pandemic. And you can see that I reported the national average, and then I subdivided these in three uh, areas that reflect Northern regions, Central regions, and Southern regions. And you can clearly see that for Northern regions, the number of uh, cases and uh, hospitalization, the red line, were much higher compared to the central and the southern regions. Actually, southern regions had really few numbers of cases, but also realization of deaths. Um, I also reported here the timing of the intervention. Um, and you can see that at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, uh, the government implemented a partial lockdown uh, targeted toward the red zone areas where the uh, COVID was already present. Uh, in the communities, but this was not effective because clearly it was a, a reactive strategy, it's not a proactive. So then the government was forced to implement a national lockdown, as I was discussing before. And you can see that the national lockdown, as I also show in the conceptual framework, uh, was able somehow to reduce the number of infection and the number of hospitalization. And with the decreased trend uh, in these outcomes, uh, the government also started the exit phase that was uh, based on three main phases that culminated the 3rd of June here. Uh, so at the beginning of the summer, when there were no restrictions. And this, uh, let's say, moment, period of no restriction lasted until uh, the end of the summer and the beginning of autumn, uh, when then the number of cases started to increase again, as well as the number of hospitalizations. To give you uh, a link with the uh, framework that I presented before, we also uh, implemented uh, and categorized the intervention adopted uh, for the containment um, category. Uh, and you can see here the stringency highlighted in different colors. And uh, as I just uh, discussed, you can see that the main import, main, the most significant interventions were applied in March, so at the beginning of the pandemic with the national lockdown that was implemented the 9th of March with the U.S. Casa decree, and with the very significant intervention that is indeed the lockdown plus the suspension of all non-essential economic activities, the 22nd of March. With the uh, end of the spring and the uh, clear effect of the uh, lockdown strategies, the government started the reopening. And for all the summer, as I said, there were no restrictions. Only at the end of the summer, with the start of new cases and new hospital admissions, there, were, uh, there was a medium intervention. There was the closure of discos and nightclubs, but nothing more, until November, when the government was forced to implement a new lockdown, the 4th November. However, this new lockdown signed an uh, uh, important variation in the response strategy in Italy because it implemented a differentiated lockdown that was based on the traffic light systems. So uh, the regions were, are actually uh, still assessed um, um, every two weeks uh, on a base of 21 parameters that are mainly related to epidemiological outcomes. 
and they are classified uh, um, uh, in terms of um, their risk with three different colors, uh, sorry, four. So white, uh, yellow, orange, and red. So this degree really shifted the paradigm of the policy response strategies in Italy. However, uh, since this was implemented just at the end of the first year of the pandemic, we also tried to understand what was before the rationale for implementing restrictive measures uh, in, uh, in Italy. And we identified that the uh, real or the most important determinants for this was the number of hospitalization. You can clearly see that, I will, uh, that the number of hospitalization uh, dictated the stringency of the policy intervention, because as soon uh, the uh, number of hospitalization increased, stringent measures were applied. Conversely, clearly when the uh, outcome started to decrease. And during the summer, you can see that uh, there were no intervention until, as I said before, the re-increase in the hospitalizations. But the hospital system was also a very important uh, uh, dimension to consider when we looked at the relevance of the government intervention, because uh, for some regions, um, the healthcare system would have been really challenged by the higher demand uh, for hospital care. And I reported here six regions that uh, would have seen the healthcare system collapsed without the intervention and the, uh, without the intervention of the government by increasing the hospital capacity, particularly on ICU uh, beds. You can see here I reported the blue area. Uh, that was the saturation that would have uh, occurred with the initial hospital capacity that is quite above the 100%, so the full saturation, and the uh, ICU saturation that we observed with the new ICU capacity, thanks to the government intervention. To avoid such catastrophic outcomes, the government in November also imposed the regions to uh, implement or to, let's say, um, impose at least 14 ICU beds per 100,000 inhabitants. And this is a picture uh, uh, that I took uh, uh, in January 2021, where you can see that most uh, of the region, almost uh, all of the regions were able to meet this uh, target. So uh, in this paper, we also look at and categorize uh, with the framework, uh, the CPTI framework, the uh, relevance and the intensity of the economic intervention applied. And you can see that especially in March and April, where the uh, first wave was um, very um, significant and also the uh, stringency of the measures was very significant, they were the most important uh, um, economic uh, intervention applied. And this related to fiscal and monetary intervention, mainly to protect the enterprises, but also the workers that were not able to, to work. There was also a significant uh, um, contribution from the European Central Bank, uh, Bank that uh, um, implemented unprecedented economic stimulus, uh, the quantitative easing, but also um, um, financial measures to help the uh, countries, the, the members of the European Union. So to conclude this experience and to move on, um, we have seen that COVID-19 clearly significantly affected Italy with severe health, social, and economic consequences. But we have also seen that the strictness and the timing of escalating and de-escalating containment and prevention measures played a major role in um, avoiding catastrophic outcomes, such as, for example, in terms of mortality and ICU saturation, but also in alleviating the impact um, uh, for the economic sector. Um, an interesting uh, uh, aspect to consider is also that the government during the first year, but also uh, now, did not invest uh, in tracing technology. Indeed, the app uh, that was developed to trace the contact was not developed by the government or a public uh, health uh, state agency, but was developed by a private uh, enterprise. And this uh, um, was not uh, seen uh, um, like in a favorable uh, way from the population because this app was not successful at all after six months was uh, basically dismissed. 
An important aspect is also uh, that we also consider are the spillover effects that all these interventions produce for the society. I just want to mention two outcomes that are the number of uh, suicides uh, during the first uh, months of the pandemic and the access to education. So for the suicides, we have uh, evidence that there was an, a significant increase uh, of suicide victims uh, that for uh, the month uh, from January to April 2020 uh, was 42 compared to the 25 um, uh, referring to the previous, sorry, compared to the 14 uh, from the previous year, uh, 2020, 2019. Okay, so there was a significant increase. For the access to education, there was online schooling, as in most countries, but clearly uh, there are some areas that are disadvantaged in this aspect, not only for the internet connection, but also in terms of income. Not all the family are able to have uh, the necessary equipment to uh, allow uh, children to uh, go to the courses simultaneously. Okay, so these are outcomes that must be assessed in the medium and long term period particularly uh, referring to the um, outcomes on the um, human capital development. Um, yes, so again, um, happy to answer any question on this, otherwise I proceed uh, to the next uh, paper that uh, start to look at the uh, situation after the vaccine authorization. Yeah, so that's a good idea, I think, uh, uh, for you to do that. Um, and also, I would say to present the, uh, the global survey that uh, we are conducting. Um, uh, so I, I would uh, yeah, take a deep breath now. We, we encourage everybody to write their comments, questions. And obviously, um, um, we will collect them uh, towards the end. If you can, Marcello, just focus on... Uh, uh, the key aspects for the um, uh, next study uh, on HPT, uh, and then uh, try, try to, uh, if I may suggest, to focus on on the uh, on the survey uh, so that the participants may uh, find it interesting to interact with us and uh, uh, maybe even some of them to uh, uh, to be involved uh, um, in it. Uh, so take it away. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, so I will try to uh, focus on the main outcomes. So uh, for the second part of this uh, presentation, I would like to uh, discuss the main findings that we um, try to identify uh, looking at the experience in the vaccination of our strategies in four countries that are reported here, France, Israel, Italy, and Spain. And also this study is part of the second special issue that the value in health economics and policy group developed in collaboration with health policy and technology. So, um, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the availability of vaccines gives to policymakers a very powerful tool to combat and fight the spread of the pandemic and also to avoid the negative outcomes that I just uh, discussed. And we looked at four countries that have a very good experience and success in uh, um, achieving a high level of coverage um, in a short time, because these four countries were able uh, to achieve more than 60% of their population fully vaccinated by the 30th September. And this clearly can set best practices, but also policy learning for other countries. Um, what is interesting uh, about these countries is that they were successful, but they faced different challenges and implemented different uh, strategies in their vaccination campaign. So the aim then was clearly to uh, synthesize this evidence and see uh, what are the policy learnings that we can um, uh, like, uh, find from these uh, experiences. For future uh, waves of COVID-19, because we have seen that we will probably need boosters to maintain the protection, but also for uh, future public health crisis. So as always, I reported here the epidemiological trend. Uh, you can see here uh, different outcomes. Um, and uh, you can see that France, Italy, and Spain face the similar impact of COVID-19 in terms of death and ICU patients, while Israel was uh, moderately affected by uh, the COVID-19. What is interesting, however, is that Israel was the first country 
to introduce the green pass among these four, that is the vaccination certificate. And also that um, Israel was the country that implemented the most uh, effective strategies, or at least was able to um, cover uh, uh, more than 50% of uh, its population in a very short time, compared also to the other countries that faced much, uh, much more uh, severe uh, outcomes in terms of uh, um, deaths and SU patients and also on the pressure on hospital system. So one may think that uh, bad experience with COVID-19 might also push these governments to really try to um, implement the most effective strategies and cover as soon as possible their population. So we wanted to understand what is the reason behind this difference. So to do this, we look at the uh, objective and the metrics adopted, and also uh, we identified two main dimensions that was very relevant to explain such differences. In terms of goal, for all the four countries uh, follow a similar um, strategy. So they looked at the reduct, they tried to achieve a reduction of virus cause morbidity and mortality while prioritizing the most vulnerable groups. Uh, for the medics, especially at the beginning of, of the pandemic, they looked at the vaccination, uh, sorry, at the vaccine availability, so the number of doses available. What is interesting, however, is the purchasing strategy adopted by the, the, these countries. And uh, here we can see, uh, probably explain the difference in the um, vaccination coverage that I showed you before, because Israel was very effective in its purchasing strategies because it was able uh, to an agreement with Pfizer to uh, um, like ensure uh, all the doses are needed to protect its um, population. Uh, but in exchange, this agreement, uh, um, among other things, uh, established that Israel would have uh, given the epidemiological data relevant to the assessment of the vaccine safety and efficacy to Pfizer. So this is clearly was a controversial agreement, also because it was not disclosed immediately by the government, but as we have seen, was effective. For uh, the European countries instead, uh, the European member countries uh, joined a European scheme that was really trying to uh, increase the ability of the uh, vaccine manufacturers to develop effective vaccine and also to increase their bargaining power with the manufacturer. But this was not so effective as for the Israeli case, because um, Italy, Spain, and France faced uh, uh, supply problems, especially during the first five months of the pandemic, where the manufacturers were not able to uh, meet the uh, number of doses uh, agreed. And there was also a, a further um, delay because of the suspension of AstraZeneca in March, where there were, if you remember, uh, problems related to blood clots and thrombosis events. Another interesting aspect is the governance of the vaccination rollout that really reflects the um, health system design in these countries. Indeed, Italy and Spain, that has a decentralized national healthcare system, uh, gave the responsibility of the vaccine distribution to the regional governments. France, that instead has a very centralized system, um, adopted a centralized deployment strategies. And Israel, that has a national health insurance model, uh, where there are five health plans that uh, uh, provide coverage for the population and also provide um, they provide the services uh, to the enrollees, um, adopted a centralized purchasing strategies, but then the rollout was uh, given and attributed to these five health plans. So this clearly also can explain why in the short term uh, Israel was also more efficient than the others to deploy uh, the vaccine dose. Uh, here there is the proportion of the vaccines available. Uh, you can see that what I just said is reflected on this table with Israel that has mostly Pfizer, uh, while the other countries have a more mixed um, typology of vaccines. And then I now would like to briefly uh, focus on the uh, main challenges that governments are facing to uh, achieve the high level of uh, vaccination. That is um, hesitancy for COVID-19 vaccine, and I would say also hesitancy for vaccines in general. So clearly, uh, all these countries face a low level of vaccines overall, uh, vaccine hesitancy overall, because they were indeed effective in their 
uh, strategy, but France and Italy uh, face a relatively higher uh, hesitancy compared to Israel and uh, Spain. Particularly Spain is interesting because um, the Spanish population uh, was quite, uh, um, um, has a really high trust in public health bodies, but also in the vaccines. And it was also showed by a national uh, survey that really uh, certified a high level of trust in the uh, public health bodies and vaccines. And this is clearly reflected in the strategies that have been adopted to incentivize or penalize um, vaccine uptake or vaccine non-consumption. Um, so Israel, France, and Spain uh, adopted uh, indirect or direct measures to increase vaccine uptake with bans uh, for unvaccinated people to uh, public health venues and even to go to work in some cases. And I want to focus briefly on Israel and Italy because Israel was the first country in the world to adopt, as I said, the vaccination certificate, the Green Pass in February, so immediately, as soon as the vaccine were um, available, and also the first one to impose the reinforced Green Pass, that is the requirement for the population to have the third dose in order to have a valid vaccination certificate. In Italy, it was interesting uh, because uh, it was the first Western country to uh, impose a mandatory vaccination for healthcare professionals, and also was the first man, uh, country to mandate the Green Pass uh, certificate um, in order to go to work to their population. And this means that Green Pass uh, must be uh, shown every day from the workers, and a uh, valid Green Pass is um, obtained either with the proof of vaccination or with a negative swab test. And in Italy, the negative the swab tests are not free. They cost, actually, they cost 15 euros. So you can imagine how um, uh, high is the impact uh, in terms of income for an individual that doesn't want to be vaccinated. And finally, just because it's like an intervention that was adopted two weeks ago, Italy was also the first country to impose a mandatory vaccination for all the people uh, over 15 years old as a condition to go to work. Okay. So briefly here, uh, just to show you the impact of vaccine on epidemiological and economic uh, and societal outcomes, I would say, uh, we looked at the trend in 2020 and 2021 for these four uh, countries in terms of fatalities and SU hospitalization. You can clearly see that for 2021, there is a decrease uh, compared to the previous year. So there is a, um, an evidence of the impacts of vaccines but it's not as evident as we would expect. And a reason for this um, is that the data uh, that are available in the international database cannot really see the differences in the um, typology of people that are admitted to hospitals or that, are, um, or that uh, record fatalities. Uh, I was able to disentangle this looking at the Italian uh, data and to show uh, the different topology of uh, uh, patients admitted to hospital, uh, dividing by between people that are not vaccinated, people that receive their vaccine uh, um, in a period uh, before, uh, sorry, longer than four or six months. And you can clearly see that the blue line that represents the no vaccinated people makes the most of the um, data uh, related to fatalities, case, and ICU admission. And this is quite interesting because then the previous figure shown here uh, with this um, uh, understanding of the data might clearly be uh, much more different and might signal a much more uh, effective effectiveness of the vaccines in the outcome. In terms of societal outcomes, uh, I would like to focus on the stringency index of the policy adopted. Uh, where you can clearly see that uh, for all the countries, as soon as the uh, population reach a certain level of uh, vaccination coverage that can be assimilated to 60%, more or less, uh, the government started to decrease their stringency intervention. However, for France, Italy, and Israel, um, particularly for France and Italy, where there was a relatively higher uh, level of residency, 
uh, the government was were forced to uh, actually increase and uh, go back to the previous uh, level of stringency compared, for example, to Spain, where the uh, lifting of the measure is constant and is at now a very low level. Okay. So uh, la last outcomes is uh, we try to find a correlation between the COVID-19 experience in terms of fatalities in each region uh, for these uh, four countries and the willingness to get vaccinated. We did this uh, with a scatter plot that you can see here. And we can see that there is a, a different uh, uh, relation between the two outcomes. However, running the sperm and row correlation test, we did not find any significant, uh, physically significant effect, uh, or let's say correlation uh, between these two outcomes. So we cannot say that uh, uh, we found uh, that actually the COVID-19 experience affected the willingness of the population to be vaccinated. So to conclude, and then I move to the uh, uh, last study that I'm now running, um, we have seen that there is evidence of vaccines in reducing hospitalization and uh, fatalities. Uh, so it's quite important to uh, achieve a successful vaccination campaign and that the success of these vaccination campaigns really depend on vaccinate uh, on the trust on vaccines and public health authorities, but also on um, governments and on uh, policy makers. Uh, so important uh, policy indication is that it's not uh, required only for governments to ensure sufficient supply of vaccines or even infrastructure to deliver these vaccines, but it's very important to target uh, trust in the population and trust in the uh, vaccines. So uh, now I'll go, I think, directly to That's very good. Um, yeah. So it's just yeah, one slide. Bit... It's just one slide. That is yeah, not much, yeah, that's so... very good. Uh, yeah. We're running a bit behind. Um, I suppose that uh, uh, we will allow for a, uh, we, we will allow questions for um, 10 minutes after uh, you finish. Try to finish in the next three minutes, Marcello. Yes, yes. yes. You know the important points of this and then if people are interested, of course, we can connect individually. Yes. So um, as, you, as I just showed, um, hesitancy is a very important topic to understand and to maximize the vaccination strategies and the effectiveness of the vaccination policies. So now we are running uh, studies that try to elicit public preferences, trade off and hesitancy for the COVID-19 vaccine. And this is an international study. So we will uh, compare different countries. So the aim of this uh, study is really to try to shed light on what factors drive individual vaccination decisions at the country level, try to inform decision makers about cross-country variation preferences for vaccination hesitancy versus restrictions, and finally, hopefully, uh, try to enable policymakers to design and implement incentive-compatible financial and non-financial solutions to optimize behavioral responses to policies. We are trying to do this um, through uh, the design of the uh, discrete choice experiment uh, that we developed with uh, uh, the team that is currently working with me on this project um, and that follow quite uh, a robust methodology. I'm clearly uh, more than happy to discuss this with you if you're interested to learn more. But what's important is that these studies will, uh, um, at the moment, uh, um, include 10 uh, countries. And we will uh, run this questionnaire as uh, the first wave uh, in the next month. So stay tuned for uh, the advancement of this project and any updates that we uh, will have. And possibly uh, for the next PhD talks so when, I, when we will develop this study and um, being able to um, um, like uh, spread <laughs> the findings that we find. I'm not sure, Francesco, if you want something more on this, or uh, I can stop and take the questions. Yes, yes, wait. So I suppose yeah. that the main message here, uh, Marcello will write now in the chat uh, his email um, mm -hmm. about the service. So the service already uh, being funded to cover more than 10 countries. Fundamentally, we have uh, developed uh, uh, a large network of partners globally 
um, and uh, fundamentally, you know, countries uh, that are covered uh, range from um, Australia to Italy, Spain, uh, the UK, the US, uh, Brazil. Uh, now I can't remember them all um, by, by heart, but South Korea, uh, yeah. North Korea, uh, no, no, South, South, no, Korea. South Korea, sorry, South Korea. And so, so uh, obviously, uh, we are uh, excited about inviting more countries. And um, uh, the, the, the reality of it is that, uh, you know, there are just uh, what we ask you just for the, the, the uh, contribution to uh, pay for the collection in that particular country. We have organized, of course, already the survey and uh, uh, fundamentally also the, the company or, or, or that, that, that does the extraction. Obviously, if there are better options locally, we're open to it. So if you're interested um, in this, ultimately this is the objective to create a sort of platform that uh, allows us to, uh, 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 while we are in this dynamic and future ones, to really understand uh, um, uh, not only attitudes toward vaccines, but also more in general towards risk uh, and, and uh, towards health benefits that derive from vaccination, but also in relation to other types of restrictions so that we have this uh, uh, as a multi -way, multiple wave uh, way of, of monitoring um, uh, uh, people's attitudes uh, over time uh, in different countries. I think it's uh, a great uh, effort that involves Erasmus on the School of Economics. Uh, uh, I see Rebecca there. Um, it involves uh, uh, North Army in the UK, Bologna in Italy, uh, a number of other collaborators uh, uh, that uh, now we have the slides for that and now I'm, I'm uh, concerned about time, so I'm going uh, quite Oslo University uh, and, and so on. So anyway, um, I thought we conclude like that to, to invite you to uh, interact with us in the Value Net Economics and Policy uh, group. I see some questions now. Uh, now, uh, Katie, I have so many points I'd like to discuss with you, and perhaps you should share a separate time. Absolutely, Katie. Uh, I, I was, in fact, talking about you this morning. Um, uh, and I will do that. Uh, uh, if you have uh, points that you want to uh, uh, have an answer immediately uh, or you think the audience should know, given that uh, you are probably the uh, most uh, uh, knowledgeable uh, uh, on these topics, um, uh, please, please do, uh, do, do uh, uh, give your wisdom here. Um, uh, yes, okay. Uh, uptake versus that is a very, very good point. Um, and uh, uh, now uh, Daiga, uh, also high, uh, uh, also interested on the DC. Yes, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Thank you, Katie, for uh, indeed sharing references with us on that. Um, and we'll certainly be in, in touch. In fact, Marcello, go ahead and, and uh, schedule a meeting with Katie. That would be very good for us and also with Daiga. Uh, Kiaki. Kojima, sorry for the pronunciation. I'm also a bit blind these days, but uh, uh, from uh, the, uh, the question, how did you adjust, Marcello, the natural epic curve of COVID-19 to evaluate the effect of government policy intervention? Uh, for example, the Sydney lockdown did not seem to show significant result as it was uh, also on the surge of upgoing de Delta strain. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, we uh, didn't adjust really uh, in a sophisticated way the uh, epic curve of COVID-19, but we looked at standardized measures such as like the spread, the number of infections and the number of hospitalization per 100,000 or per million. Uh, so that um, uh, gave us like uh, easy comparability across countries and also uh, provide us with like uh, easy uh, way to uh, show this graphically. Um, so clearly, um, the study that I presented was also done in the first year of the pandemic where the data were not so um, precise. Uh, so there is also this factor to consider, but certainly for the uh, future papers uh, and also in the going uh, forward, this is a, a clear um, adjustment that we need to take in order to correlate uh, the effectiveness of the intervention and the outcomes. Excellent. Um, any other points? Uh, otherwise, we can come to a closing. Thanking everybody uh, that has participated. Marcello will write to both Katie and Daiga and whomever else wants to 
uh, meet uh, separately. Congratulations, Marcel. Very good uh, uh, overview of your work. Now we have uh, um, a thank uh, also from Chiara. Uh, great talk indeed. Um, all right, so we can come to a close. Um, and um, um, thank you, Marcel. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you um, for those who asked questions. Thank you for those who participated. Um, and uh, we are uh, very eager to continue with this talk on uh, talks on a monthly basis. We will also resume uh, the forums uh, uh, from March. So stay tuned on uh, our newsletter. Um, if you're not part of that newsletter, please uh, make talk contact with Marcello. We'll add you. Uh, thank you, Zephany, for making this uh, 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 event uh, uh, possible. Um, and uh, have a good day, night, uh, or afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.